We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Last Flight of Noah's Ark on June 25th, 1980. It was written by Stephen W. Karabatsos, Sandy Glass, and George Arthur Bloom, based on the novel The Gremlins Castleby by Ernest K. Gann, directed by Charles Jarrett and released by Buena Vista, AKA Disney. So many, so many very complex names. <laughs> yes. The plane was a Boeing B-29 super fortress, which you refer to as the Millennium Falcon <laughs> at the beginning of the <laughs> yeah. movie. And it's not a coincidence. The ship was indeed inspired by this, this particular model of plane. Oh, okay. We start the film. Noah is in bed. He's waking up to someone knocking at his door and Benchley walks in with muscle, Mr. Coslow. He says that Noah owes Mr. Parker a great deal of money. It sounds like he just lost a big bet on a horse race. Noah seems to think that he won $50,000. Where have you guys been anyway? Parker owes me. That red-hot parley I've been driving paid off in the ninth last night when Attaboy Star got his nose under the wire in front. (laughs) Ha ha! 50,000 smackers! Fat city! But apparently between going to bed and waking up, it turns out that his horse, Attaboy Star, was disqualified for interfering in the stretch. And he now has 24 hours to come up with $5,000. And then a week for the rest of the, it. The, the other 45000 Well, I don't know if he... Because it's not always the case that winning 50000 that the opposite would be losing the 50000 Oh, that, no, that's, no, that's, not at that's, all. That's true. I, that's I, I wasn't odds. thinking. But he said a week for the rest. Yeah. So, and I, so I assume he owes that, more money. Yeah. He does. I, we just I, don't know what the odds are. My guess would be if you're if you're only asking for 5000 up front, that the rest is probably not more than 5000 mm. So I would say it's probably 10000 total based on absolutely nothing. Mr. Parker will wait a week for that. Coslo socks Noah in the gut and he falls backwards onto his bed. He immediately starts scrounging around for work he stops by an airport offering to do delivery work but the word is out that he's kind of a baloo when it comes to flight Mm -hmm. how much is this character not inspiration for baloo a disney property yeah no for sure for the tailspin version of blue sorry i should correct myself that he wasn't the inspiration for the obviously this guy inspired the jungle book but yeah no it's what what else did we decide that was a, a big influence on Tailspin? Or was it the other way around, that Tailspin was an inspiration for something else? Oh, mm. uh, Bruce McGill's character. Oh, Jack Dalton? Because he has the seaplane in that one episode. Of right, like, right, Oh, right. this is totally a Baloo character. Noah goes to speak with another friend, Slobotsky, who owns a flying circus. But uh, he can't seem to fit Noah on the payroll. And he tells him to go to 20th, which is probably short for 20th Century Fox, where they need pilots for a movie. But it seems that Noah already checked into this. And the movie's been canceled. Because war movies are not bankable. They're all making space movies with robot pilots now. He pulls up to a gate. And he seems reluctantly to move through it to talk to his last option. As he's arriving in this small trailer parked on the lot. Another pilot is coming out. Turning down a risky job in this crappy motorhome. He says, No, uh, you couldn't pay me triple to take it up. And then this Stephen Root-esque character, Stoney, seems delighted to see Noah Dugan, his old friend. You see, you say Stephen Root, I say more Charles Durning. Okay. Well, either way, he's, he's a cross between them, maybe. He looks like he's drinking a glass of soapy water with a cigarette in it. I can't tell what he's holding. But apparently the job is very simple. You just have to drop off a delivery on this island, refuel, and turn around. They walk together to this shed on his property, and he's slowly backing up to it. And he seems very suspiciously hesitant about sharing what kind of a plane he'll be flying. He points out that he knows Noah is out of options and can't refuse this one. But uh, when he opens the door, we see that the plane is a moldy B-29. I'm not sure why they had to walk through this shed. He could for sure see the plane from yeah, the other B-29 side. B-29 is not a small plane. Yeah, it's huge. So he could he could see it the whole way up to this shed. 
apparently some passengers and animals will be joining him. But then Stoney says, The kids aren't going. They're here to wave goodbye to the animals. Noah has no interest in flying a plane full of animals. Uh, Stoney says that the woman that he sees in the background will be coming along. She's a missionary. And she said prayers over the animals. They're holy animals. They're religious animals. And there's nothing to worry about here. But as we learned in the island, you don't fly with animals. You crash with animals. Do we think that Stoney here is like taken by her? I think or he's or is just, he trying just trying to rip trying off. to just trying to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Especially from what happens later in this conversation. But he says she's coming along on the flight and that she her plan is to bring these animals to this tribe on an island and she's gonna teach them how to farm and how to mate the animals and to keep a providing for themselves. The woman's name is Bernadette Lafleur and she's being she's working right now with a woman that runs the orphanage named Charlotte Braithwaite and Stoney introduces them to Noah and Bernadette says that they're going to the island of Makwarana. Noah hey, advises Makwarana. <laughs> this is not a real place, correct? I don't think so. I didn't look it up. Noah advises Lafleur. <laughs> I didn't look it up, but <laughs> nope. <laughs> just, just <laughs> Never heard of it. Doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not real. Uh, I feel like I would have heard of it. I've heard of basically every island. Noah advises Lafleur to get her money back from Stoney because he's not going to be flying her Bronx Zoo anywhere. Stoney says, "Sorry, I spent your money already, so you don't get it back." And Lafleur says, "Oh well, that's great." I'm a missionary, but I am not a pushover. I'll go to the police. And then Stoney begs Noah to take the offer, and he says, "Please just take this gig. I'll give you two thousand dollars." Even though he just told this lady he doesn't have anything. Maybe I misunderstood this deal, but he says that he wants three thousand on delivery and return of the cargo in Honolulu. I don't know if that means he gets two thousand up front still, and then three thousand at the end. I- I'm assuming because he to make needs up the, the five. Yeah, but yeah. he needed that five by tonight. And he's mm-hmm. not going to have it by tonight. Well, but that's why he's going away. Then he doesn't need the money at all. Well, he still wants to come back, though. So he's going away, so he doesn't need it tonight. But th- aren't they going to want interest if up. he comes back after his deadline with the 5000 I don't know. You know what bothers me is you owe Bookie money, and then <laughs> he breaks your legs. You still owe him the money. It just doesn't seem fair to me. Noah moves to check out the plane. Outside, Ricky Schroeder is scratching a cow's neck. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like some kind of euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> That's what we call it. God. Back on the farm. Hey, kid, you want to put that away? <laughs> <laughs> Go out back and scratch the cows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> unacceptable. Inside the plane, Noah checks out the ancient cockpit. A crowd of children are calling to a duck that has somehow wandered halfway down a tube in the plane, and Noah's forced to get inside and chase it out. The duck bites him in the face, and then he tumbles out of the chute onto the runway. It turns out Benchley is watching them. He's pulled up in the road, and uh, he's just sitting in his car watching to make sure he doesn't skip town. But he's letting him get inside of a plane before he does yeah. anything. So well, he's not watching super closely. Well, yeah, I would think that Benchley would know at this point. He's a he's, pilot. He's a pilot. Yeah. And if he's going to get $5,000, he's going to need to do a job. Yeah. Which involves flying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as Noah tries to leave, he notices Benchley and Coslow and suddenly decides, you know what? I'm not ditching this job. Everybody get in the plane. We're leaving right now because he thinks they're about to just nab him. So Noah goes and he tells Stoney to basically stall them. And he's trying to yank Brutus, this longhorn steer. I don't know what this species is called. Yeah, It's, it's, not, a, it's not a bull. It, yeah, it's a, it's a very unusual type of uh, I think it's a I think it's a Texas longhorn. Okay, I'm just going to call it a longhorn moving forward and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> I'll forward all tweets to your non-existent Twitter account. I don't have any expertise in cattle. Perfect. He's trying to yank the longhorn into the plane when uh, Ricky Schroeder as Bobby explains that the animal needs to trust you like a friend. And then he coaxes Brutus in. The longhorn comes uncomfortably close to spearing uh, this child in the face with one of its horns, though. Nobody seems to notice but me. The entire cast is fine and the crew, like the camera didn't shake about the murder. Uh, (laughs) Stoney leads the bookies into his office and he says that they're going to wait for Noah there. The kids are all saying their goodbyes to the animals. 
but I get the impression already that they'll be stowing away here. Mm -hmm. Noah has already threatened to eat this cow once, or the longhorn. Noah's going over his pre-flight checklist as Bobby second guesses leaving his animals with this guy who just threatened to barbecue the most delicious one. And both Bobby and Julie make a run for the plane when Noah and Bernadette are distracted. Noah almost crushes Bobby, closing the bomb bay doors. He's like climbing into the plane and that's mm-hmm. the last thing that they close up. The kid's just screaming like he's about to get smashed in half. <laughs> this really bothered you when we were watching because you're just like, just step on the thing yeah. that's coming up and you'll be lifted into the plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, it wasn't like pinching him. It was just coming up from below. But then the kids rush to the back of the plane and they're peeking out of a window and Braithwaite, the woman from the orphanage, notices them in the plane still because she didn't get a head count before they left. She pulled it home alone she suddenly decides we have to pull out onto the runway and stop this plane so they don't get away so they drive out to the runway and she gets out of the car and she's trying to gesture to them in the cockpit like there's kids you have children but she's not saying like no or stop or anything like that around the same time the the bad guys decide that he must be in this plane trying to leave and we get our third scene this year of a car trying to chase a plane across a runway after a rough cut and our previous movie Herbie goes bananas it only worked once so far Mm -hmm. Uh, but the the title finally shows up 17 and a half minutes into the film yeah I was like oh the here are the titles yeah (laughs) Bernie is already complaining that Noah is smoking a cigar in the cockpit it's Bernadette we get this musical interlude of a song called half of me which is original to this film it's performed by Alexandra Brown and it's composed by Maurice Jari and the lyrics are from Hal David and it's real bad. Yeah. It's a bad song. You'd be my wings far on the head of me is me. The and the combination with the credits on screen makes it feel super TV movie-ish. In the cockpit, Bernie is playing music that Noah doesn't care for. You have to listen to that junk junk mr dugan boring bernie the subtitle said it was a a brandenburg concerto from bach she says it's bach yeah but the the credit said brandenburg concerto when it starts and then she says it's bach you plebe because he doesn't like it and they agree that she'll turn off the music if he puts out the cigar by now it's like dark outside so he's definitely not smoking the same cigar that he started when he took off but he told her when he first lit it that He only smokes for takeoff and landing. By sheer coincidence, when Noah moves to engage the autopilot, sparks blast up from the floor right where he stomped out the cigar. So I thought he actually, like, messed up the plane when he stomped out the cigar, Mm -hmm. but it seems like it's actually just coincidence. But to calm him, Bernie announces that she's actually trained for a few hours on the mission Cessna, an admittedly smaller plane that the orphanage for some reason splurged on. I don't know why they need a tiny plane. but apparently they have one and uh, he mocks her for a bit and then he takes her up on the offer. (laughs) She panics almost immediately. And then suddenly a mallard comes flying out of the back of the plane (laughs) and uh, lands in the cockpit. And he's like, what the hell is this? Because the girl had the duck with her and it should have left with Julie. Uh, Bernie tries to fly a little bit and she's not doing a great job. Yeah. So is she not doing a great job or is he sabotaging it for her? No, she's freaking out. Okay, but it seems weird because she does fine later. I agree. Mm-hmm. So I agree that that's weird. It's but weird? he's not touching okay, anything. It just so. seems like maybe he he like screwed it up for her. It's like here you try, and you know he's like secretly pushing down on you know his. No, I I think he literally just threw her into it before she had a chance to even think about it really, and so that's why she was panicking right away because she was like, I don't even know if he's going to help at all for the rest of this flight. This guy could be suicidal for all I know. He follows the kids to the back of the plane to check on the cow that they tell him is sick he leaves bernie at the wheel but now she seems to be doing fine as he's checking on the cow he is suddenly launched and kicked unconscious by brutus like the longhorn kicks him and he hits his head on the side of the plane and is literally knocked out so now the only person who knows how to fly this plane is unconscious and in the cockpit the music is playing again for some reason now bernie just has no problem she's doing great the kids rush in to inform her that the only pilot on board is unconscious or dead at the hooves of a massive longhorn that should have been asleep for this entire flight if we were following the island protocol of drugging animals that's what he did right he, yeah the, the giant pig on that plane 
she tells the kids to loosen his collar and put a wet cloth on his head and he'll be fine or hopefully he'll be fine and let me know when he's okay and don't worry god is my co-pilot well, i hope he flies better than you and surprises them by being alive and able to speak but i think a better retort to this would have been like if she said god is my co-pilot he would have been like you're not so bad yourself or something like that like she was calling him god maybe that's too blasphemous for a disney movie hours later bernie offers noah some coffee to help keep him awake because the autopilot's dead so he's been and he's also concussed and that's the last thing you want him to do yeah (laughs) he tells her to watch as far as she can toward the tail for the first light of sunrise even though there's a window in the tail yeah just go back there but it comes up 90 degrees off course and they realize they've been flying in the wrong direction all night it turns out the batteries from bernie's radio have been throwing off the compass (laughs) uh he keeps saying compass compass this made me crazy compass 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 is this a thing what saying compass no (laughs) is it a thing that (laughs) batteries batteries can create a electrical field yeah yeah Yeah. all right one of the things uh back in my early days of driving uh my dad thought it would be neat to get me a dashboard compass like a digital one compass compass (laughs) um but in the instructions it says uh you have to drive around with the engine running and set it to calibrate because the engine block oh even that's enough electricity was enough to alter the compass direction interesting interesting i mean i knew that um you know you can make an electromagnet you know by wrapping wires around a, a battery but i didn't realize that you know if you if you did nothing to a battery and just brought it near a compass that it would it do has anything. a field yeah, yeah. Well, well there's i don't know he says the battery but also a radio would have a magnet inside of it on its own which would be just as bad yeah so oh yeah there, there, yeah, there are there are other fair. things unless the the batteries are powering the magnet inside the radio yeah i, I feel it's not totally plausible like implausible to have happened but sure. I, I feel like that she would have had to have had the radio right on top of the compass like which she i think did. she did, she did. it yeah. was hanging right there at this point they will be lucky if they make it to the island with any fuel at all because they're so far off course if they can even find the island or make it to any island yeah. they have no idea where they are because right. they don't know how long they've been flying off course right yeah. i mean they could do some math as far as like when did we put that there where, what direction where the sun does it is, say yeah. when your stuff is there but um the next day uh noah tries to radio for help but bernie and the kids are sending hopes and prayers instead of charting a course to safety bobby notices that An island has just emerged on the horizon. The engines are just starting to fail for lack of fuel. So they point the plane at them and Bernie lights a cigar for the landing process. Which which I I really like this. (laughs) She's like, all right, here it comes. Yeah, she she puts a cigar in his mouth and lights it. And I was just like, yeah, this is is already like a good good situation. Yeah. He says, I'm going to try and pancake her into the beach from the water. Which sounds awful. I would have been like, nope. <laughs> Do something else. Think of another breakfast food. Because I hate that the way that sounds well, already. I don't really want to waffle you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I would, ju- I'm gonna juice it right into the run, right into the beach. I'm gonna omelet. So I'm gonna scramble this plane. I'll let you finish here. <laughs> scramble this plane. Perfect. The landing goes better than anyone would expect, but the plane is for sure done flying ever. Suddenly, we move to the perspective of a character on this island speaking in Japanese. How far did they go? They couldn't possibly have gotten to Japan if they were aiming for Honolulu. I'm already worried that this is a Hiro Onoda situation, and it turns out it 100% is. Mm -hmm. Hiro Onoda was a Japanese soldier who served on a small island in the Philippines in World War II, and he did not learn that the war had ended until the mid-70s. Bernie is lecturing Noah on the beach about the preparations they'll have to make to survive here on this island. And they build animal corrals on the beach and try to transform the plain interior into living quarters for them. A second islander speaking Japanese confirms that the plane has crash landed and the two of them move back into the jungle. The kids are left alone with the animals for a while while Bernie and Noah look for fresh water. These kids are very unsupervised. Where are they going to go? But I mean, they don't know this island. I would have brought the kids with me. Like what if there's a tribe on this island and it's like one of those outsider tribes that just kills people as soon as they see them that's the thing okay don't leave these kids alone they're, they're very tiny and there's all they could also drown who knows they're just both dead on the beach when they come back immediately brutus just books it randomly into the jungle the kids chase after him when they finally catch up with him bobby for some reason trusts the animal to lead them back over julie's instructions that isn't the way sure it is 
Yeah, but it's not like she knows any better because she's like, I wish I had Petey with me. Ducks know their way is better than bulls. Well, she's not wrong, <laughs> though, it turns out. But I feel like she at least knows we came from that direction. Let's go back that way. Noah and Bernie are moving through the jungle and he asks her why she pursued uh, missionary work. And she says that she basically played mother to a large family when her own mother died. And he asks why she didn't just start her own family, which is completely inappropriate to ask anyone. She says that the welfare of others matters more to me than my personal desires. Some guy let you down, huh? The kids notice from a hilltop that there is a Japanese military outpost where the two surviving soldiers are raising the flag of the Imperial Japanese Navy, also known as the Rising Sun Flag, which has not been in official use since the end of World War II in 1945. Noah shoots down the options of just telling them that the war is over in favor of running back to the plane for safety and trying to radio for help. In the cockpit, they argue a little bit more, and Noah says, Hey, how about playing General Custer? We could send Brutus out there on a cavalry charge. He might get shot. <laughs> then Noah goes, Yeah. <laughs> like, that, that's my idea but suddenly the two soldiers are outside the plane demanding their surrender and before they can even get so far as like opening a door to come out of the plane they try to shoot at them yeah the gun just explodes in the guy's hands because these are 40 year old guns and then he lifts a grenade and he says last chance and then throws it at this group of four people pd the duck lands right on top of it but luckily the grenade is also a dud Noah leaps from the plane and charges them with a flare gun. And the second soldier tries to shoot at him and his gun also explodes. So these guys already tried to kill them three times now. Noah wastes a flare to scare basically unarmed soldiers and then throws coconuts at them as they retreat into the jungle. Bernie feels bad for these guys that just tried to kill the orphans three times. If these guys didn't head home to seppuku, they're coming right back to slit your throats tonight. So I don't know why you're like excited to meet them. Bernie is convinced that the Christian thing to do is to try and befriend these lost men and explain to them the situation globally. She took over lookout in the night, but in the morning, of course, she's missing because we've already established that she's going to do what she thinks is right, regardless of what anyone tells her. For some reason, the flare gun that he left with her as protection is back on the plane, exactly where he checks for it. I would have just assumed she took it with her. Yeah, because she, she definitely didn't have it on her. Yeah, so she must have come back to the plane, put it away, and then left. Bernie finds a cave full of large boxes covered in netting, and she walks through it with a Bible in her hand until she gets to this bamboo hut where the Japanese soldiers have been staying. She enters the hut and slowly tiptoes through it in search of anyone. It's so clean. Yeah and well or like these guys have been living the life like they're not living in squalor or like it's it just seems like everything's really nice and neat and organized well, they've they had the island to themselves yeah. yeah but the men return while she's in their hut and she pleads with them to understand that the war is over but it turns out they both speak fluent english so that makes everything a lot easier in return for their for her kindness they prepare a full meal for her and noah at this point is like freaking out and exploring the jungle looking for her it turns out one of these two soldiers is named Hero, which is the same name of the the real holdout. I guess the real guy's name was Hero, with two O's, but this is Hero. Noah finds the hut, and from outside he can hear the soldier saying, Take that! Have more! And Bernie saying, No, please, I've had enough! And he thinks they're torturing her in here. And so he just uh, charges up a run and bursts through the door and knocks over their whole table of food. And in retaliation, they very nearly decapitate him with a sword. Bernie is quick to intervene, and she introduces Hero and Cleveland from the Japanese Navy. They've been on this island for 35 years. Hero seems less excited to be friends with Noah than Cleveland does, but Noah is mad because she ran away and didn't say anything to anyone to face off with literally soldiers from a foreign army who think they're at war with us. She says that God told her to and that he's dumb for thinking they would ever attack us, even though they already did several times. He apologizes that night for trying to save her earlier and caring if she was alive and cautioning her against her decision. And he admits that he has feelings for her, which seems completely out of nowhere. Yeah. Like he says he cares about her and it's like, this whole time you've just been rude and yelling at her and it didn't seem like it was like a, I have a crush on you I'm going to be a jerk maybe it finally sunk in that she's the only woman on this desert island he's like I'm gonna I'm gonna have a hard time sleeping with myself if I take that girl as my bride I'm gonna so. have to go pet the cow's neck 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's scratching a cow neck. He admits he has feelings for her, and the kids are watching from the plane secretly as he goes in for a kiss. A successful kiss. The, the kiss happens. As he's walking back to the plane, he knocks on the window to say goodnight to the kids that he knows we're watching the whole time. The next day, Noah tries to coach the team into gathering supplies so they can build a raft. And the Japanese soldiers suggest turning the plane into a boat. They tell Noah that if you flip it upside down, you can make a boat out of it. You see? Turn plane over. What you got? An upside down plane. No. You got boat. We get a montage of them disassembling the plane with all their man and animal power. The soldiers are loaning them all these tools and a generator to power the boat. And I thought for sure this was going to be a Flight of the Phoenix kind of scenario. I thought so too. Especially with the title, the final flight of yeah. Noah's Ark. In, but, in, in that movie, they're taking a plane and making a smaller plane out of it. But he already said that we were going to make it into right. a boat. He's saying before that Oh, point. before that you thought yeah, we were going to make it Yeah, with, with the title yeah. of the film, The Final Flight of Noah's Ark, and yeah. then But it turns the out the final crashing. flight happens during the opening credits. Yeah. They're giving them all this, these tools, and they actually even offer up their their only what looks like their only flag to be part of the sale for this boat. But it seems like they're not coming with them the way they, they act out this scene. Yeah. Noah tells the kids that they'll have to leave the animals behind. And, uh, of course, they both start bawling, and then he stupidly agrees to bring them, which is a terrible idea. But then I guess they do provide some food, but not enough i would say bernie paints noah's ark on the side of the boat plane because it's noah's and it's an ark because it's full of animals at the last second the japanese soldiers have not arrived so they just leave without them yeah what is going on these guys helped you build this boat plane for like weeks and then you're just like ah oh, sorry we told you to be here at six it's almost seven bye <laughs> you can't just wait a day but then they come running up over the hill at the very last second he's like oh it's fine they'll just swim to the boat when they get here Come on! Okay, we're coming, we're coming. Well, it's and it's a good thing that they didn't decide to wait for them because they set a bunch of bombs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apparently they agreed to meet here at 11, but this part confuses me cuz Cleveland thought 11 meant 10? Cuz I don't understand what Cleveland's saying. He says, "Yes, you rare Ben." And he holds up 10 fingers. Mhm. Well, he holds up 10 fingers, but he holds them up three times for each syllable. So he's like, 11. So he's really saying 30? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to say. But if I thought he did it twice. 11. Oh, and I it's thought like, he did it three times. If you're holding up 10 fingers, then and you thought he meant 10, then you should have been here an hour early, right? But then suddenly their, their charges explode and the whole island is engulfed in flames because they were instructed by the, the Japanese military to leave nothing behind. And so they didn't. Noah was really mad about this because it's like, what if this thing fails? Yeah, we he's have like, what no about your generator, left? all your stuff, all the tools? He's like, they're gone. <laughs> We're dumb. <laughs> he didn't say that, but. Isn't that what uh, Cortez did? Didn't he burn all of his ships when they got when they reached a new world? Like, all right, done with these. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that too, though. If I just spent like three months on a boat, I'd be like, burn that. <laughs> <laughs> Not going back. I thought we were just going to cut to credits here <laughs> as the boat is like yeah. drifting oh, yeah. off into the well, sunset. I checked the time on it. I was like, what? There's like 25 minutes left of this still. Bernie is reading a Bible at night and she goes and wakes up Noah to read him a passage from it. <laughs> He's like, oh, is there a chapter on radio repair? He doesn't want to hear anything from the Bible. Bernie got the bright idea of killing Pete the duck. So they throw the duck overboard and it just flies in the wrong direction to certain doom. She didn't want to kill him. She wanted him to find land. She was land, like, I like just read dove. a book about all the stuff that didn't happen. Let's do one of the things that didn't happen and see if well, it happens. They, they tie a <laughs> note to him. Right. But the duck that they let go, it just it doesn't know where it is. No. It just flies off. It just flies it's off. It's probably going to die in the ocean. Did they yeah. actually tie a note to the duck? Yeah. I missed that <laughs> It would be really pointless if they didn't tie a note to him. Oh, I just thought they were going to be like, okay, fly off that way a little ways and come Bring back. Bring us an olive land. branch. Tell us which way we should be going. Bring us an olive branch. We need seasonings. The duck just flies off and then he says, well, it flew the wrong way, so that's not going to help us. But it turns yeah, it's out like, maybe the duck knew that there was something that direction. Yeah, it's like, I hope he speaks Chinese. It's like, oh, man, the Chinese eat a lot of duck. <laughs> <laughs> I liked um, the line earlier, though, when she's talking about how she wants to go see the Japanese guys. And he says, yeah, but why would they trust you that 
the war is over and she says because i never lie and he's like great do you know how to say that in japanese <laughs> because it's just like they're not going to believe you if if you did say it in japanese but if you don't like you, you can't even say that you can't even lie to them in their own language julie milks melinda a cow while bobby tries to feed brutus a banana i don't know if longhorns eat bananas i don't know what they eat but banana feels wrong noah catches bobby trying to feed brutus milk and says that human food like cow's milk is not for cows <laughs> dummy <laughs> <laughs> the hens have stopped laying eggs and the cow is not giving milk anymore after this last batch noah points out that if the chickens aren't laying then we might as well eat them and bobby overhears this part of the conversation and is outraged as an animal lover that they would consider eating animals that aren't fish and he suggests that he can catch fish better than hero in cleveland who are doing a terrible job of it so far bobby suggests using a light to draw the fish in and catching them at night so from the windows below sea level they can see this plan working they turn on all their lights and the fish are basically swarming the plane boat and this is one of many times in which bobby yells at dugan and dugan yells back and then dugan says oh yeah what do you think we should do and then bobby says I, we should do x and he goes you're a genius yeah. it's like this happens like five times in the movie yeah and it's really annoying they leave julie alone with this aquarium view when suddenly we see that alongside of the fish a shark has been lured to the plane and so they decide to catch the shark i think well yeah the, i guess the shark is is following the boat and keeping the ships the, it's the fish scaring away. the fish away yeah. yeah so they catch it bobby moves to investigate it while they have it on the hook and he falls overboard and I don't so think they ever actually got it on the hook well they, they had it on the hook but it 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 it's got thrashing loose. around yeah um but bobby instead of being on the inside of the railing decides to go on the outside of the railing and then hang on with just one hand yeah, yeah. he's a kid that's how everybody does it that's how uh that's how some of us went up the stairs as a kid yeah they didn't fall off i definitely anything. didn't fall off and hit a coat rack on my way down <laughs> that for sure didn't happen uh how do you fall off of stairs my he parents spiral staircase outside. i was climbing up on the outside of the room oh yeah okay because it was a spiral yeah yeah and okay, i was I like staircase, yeah. i was like seven and i got to the top and i was like look mom and then i just fell off <laughs> and hit a big metal <laughs> coat rack on the way down well at least you didn't get eaten by a shark yeah it's all here it's all for you Damien. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i said we had just watched the omen and i wanted to freak him out <laughs> but yeah the kid falls overboard he gets eaten we cut to the next morning everyone's sad no the kid doesn't get eaten noah jumps overboard and he collects bobby from the water i Um, I think it's weird here that our soldiers are trying to prevent him from jumping in like prevent noah from jumping in yeah they're like holding him back like no no no, don't go in after the kids like he's a lost cause let him fun for himself like no i I think i think it was that i think they were worried that he was going to prove that they were shitty fishermen (laughs) and they wanted that kid to get eaten I, i i think it was that the kid's done for and if you jump in, Don't you're bother. done for too. Yeah. Like the, the, there's, there's, oh, man. this is it. You gotta try to save the kid. That's eh, crazy. Do you though? Bernie ends up killing the shark with a flare gun, but she seems really upset about it. Like maybe the shark, not unlike the Japanese soldiers, was just kidding about trying to murder orphans. <laughs> Noah chews the kid out for almost dying, but he apologizes later that night. He doesn't apologize though. He kind of does. Well, he he says, "I'm sorry. I I had to come down. I sorry. I had to come down so hard on you." Right. He didn't say, "I'm sorry. I did this." He says, "I'm." I'm I agree 100 so- percent with that wording. I'm not sorry that I yelled at you for jumping I'm on a shark. Sorry that you did this. Yeah. Because <laughs> he apologizes a lot through this movie, and I was like, if you apologize for this, this is where you are the most at in the right. And I was like, okay, I'm glad he didn't really, yeah. like, apologize, apologize. And then uh, somehow it takes until the next morning for Bernie to realize that this is all her fault. Like, no one, all of it. Like, yeah, from, every from the step get-go. of it. It's like, didn't need to put these animals on a plane, didn't need to risk these kids' yeah. lives, Did, didn't, didn't need, need to set us so far off course. Where, where, and where did they get the B-29? Was that just Stoney? Did Stoney I think just Stoney have just it? had yeah. called in a favor. Noah tries to cheer her up with some hopeful talk. He's trying to use some of her positive thinking to turn her around. And very suddenly they're hit with a bad storm and it breaks apart a lot of the scaffolding they have on the outside of the boat plane. And cracks the uh, the cockpit window. Right. So they have to shut that part of the plane off. Hero shows the kids pictures of his own children, who I wanted to see at the end of this film. They're probably 40-something by then and 80-something by now. The next morning they pop above deck to see that they have survived the storm. 
And as they celebrate above deck, Cleveland calls Dugan down and he says, He fall down very bad. I think he's dying. <laughs> and Jess was like <laughs> expecting Ricky Schroeder to just be lying there dead. <laughs> <laughs> he goes down to the bottom there's just like this kid on the floor with a katana in his back <laughs> but no it's brutus he gestures for the soldiers to get him the gun luckily not the flare gun this time yeah yeah and well, uh so there's a scene when the storm is happening and everything's breaking apart yeah. they show brutus down below decks uh just getting yanked just, around yeah rocking back and forth in this particular scene he has the nose ring in yeah mm-hmm. and, and it's and it's fastened and it's too. fastened to the side of the boat i'm like guys th- take that off of him yeah it's pretty messed up they they use it two or three times in this movie and it bothers me every single time like yeah. when the kid it seems like every time the kid is near this animal they have it chained up through the nose yeah because they have they better don't want control it to kill over Ricky it that Schroeder. way but ugh. But this yeah. this next scene i thought was gonna go a couple of different there's a, ways yeah there's a there's a lot of ways that i think this could have gone let's hear one of your alternate uh, endings at first i thought when the kid was uh desperately like pleading for the cow's life and then hero talks to him in japanese i was like is he gonna have the kid kill the cow that's what i was hoping would happen yes but then i thought hero was just gonna shoot the kid (laughs) how great would it be though if if the kid takes the gun and they make him pull the trigger and the gun just explodes like all the guns have so far (laughs) like it just didn't work and then like you hear this coast guard horn in the in the background you're just like oh i just tried to kill my best friend i like literally came completely to terms with it and pulled the trigger Mm -hmm. and i didn't kill it and now it's gonna be fine (laughs) yeah uh Uh, and brutus uh, is just like fuck you kid (laughs) like the the cow just hates him now but i I really thought it's like hero just shoots the kid and looks like that's what you wanted me to do right yeah (laughs) and and be like yeah he uh. fell down he dying (laughs) (laughs) but what actually happens is just as he gets the gun right up against Brutus's temple. We hear a Coast Guard horn honk and Bobby accidentally pulls the trigger. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. <laughs> um, they, they're like, oh my God, it's the Coast Guard ship. And so they all run above deck. And I was saying to Jess like, oh good, the, the Longhorn gets to stay alive. And she's like, no, I'm pretty sure they were saying it's like dead, dead. Like it wouldn't recover from this. And I was like, no, nah, that thing's going to be wearing a tuxedo <laughs> in the next scene. <laughs> I was sure it had to die because like, when animals like that have injuries, yeah. if you've fallen down, it means you have some sort of leg injury. They just, you know, like with horses, you just kill them. Yeah. They don't come back. Yeah. The fact that he's fine in the next scene really kind of bothered me. Yeah. So we literally cut to these establishing shots of this Coast Guard ship that just arrived. And then we're in a helicopter shot flying around both of the boats together. And you're expecting like, this is obviously the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. But no, we hear a guy say, I now pronounce you man and wife. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman from the orphanage has just given up on her, all of her plans of celibacy and has decided to marry this guy. You think she was a nun? Well, wasn't she like yeah, she, she was saying she didn't want a, a family that she wanted to help other people. She didn't want kids of her own. Well, they got two kids of their own now. Right, they do now, but when they were talking in the jungle, she said she didn't have any plans for a family. Yeah. She wanted to just help other people for the rest of her life. Yeah, I guess. I don't know that that is necessarily like a vow of celibacy. I didn't say vow, but it is <laughs> celibacy when you don't have sex with people. That's what that's called. And she's... <laughs> what? <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> uh missionary accomplished but so they're getting married now on the deck of the ship and we cut below deck to see one of the coast guardsmen just like standing next to the longhorn to show us that it's totally fine and he's a doctor so you know that it's okay yes he's a doctor the duck is there too everybody's accounted for the plane (laughs) is like back in working order no that's not true but the duck i'm assuming that the The duck had a note i think the duck flew directly to the coast guard ship yeah and not to where they thought it was going to go but if they didn't tie a note to it, I was just imagining like a duck lands on a Coast Guard ship and they're like, ha, a duck. Anyway, <laughs> like they just go back to work and the duck just picks up and flies off again. I also wanted the Coast Guard ship to just immediately get savagely rocked by pirates. <laughs> <of> pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Caine and his kid just murder all of these people. Oh my God. I want to make a double feature of these two movies with the island second and just imply that he killed the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'd be great is the implication at the end of this movie that they really did adopt the orphans 
I'm assuming, yeah, because they're orphans. That's Why two not? movies in a row where you're just like, this kid is ours now. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Disney does it. This is where kids come from. You just find them on the street. Well, he still also owes a lot of money to these bookies. Yeah, well, they're just never going back. But now the movie is actually over, and the Coast Guardsmen are enjoying an enormous rack of ribs at the reception. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. This film was directed by Charles Jarrett, who uh, will direct Condor Man next year. Yeah. He also directed uh, Genevieve Bujold in Anne of a Thousand Days, which earned both of them Oscar nominations just prior to this. The writer, Stephen W. Karabatsos, also wrote a movie called Tentacles in 77 that I want to check out. Um, about a killer octopus. <laughs> oh, oh never mind oh <laughs> no, different different uh different genre <laughs> uh he also wrote hot pursuit which was directed by tron director steve lisberger and i think it just got remade with uh, reese witherspoon and, and sofia uh, vergara yeah there you go i didn't recognize much work from the other two writers the novelist ernest k gann also wrote classic aviation novels the high and the mighty and fate is the hunter both of which were adapted into films Though those ones kept their names, this one changed from the Gremlins Castleby. Why to, was it called that? Um, I don't know. No idea. The composer was Maurice Jari, who had written the themes for Lawrence of Arabia, Doctor Zhivago, Ghost Witness, like big important stuff. And the lyrics were from lyricist Hal David. So he who, wrote the lyrics for Lawrence, Lawrence of, of Arabia. Arabia. <laughs> He's an English guy, and he came to fight the Turkish. Um, yes, he wrote those. Oh, wait, no. Stephen First wrote those, right? No, who? who wrote? Gutenberg. No, it wasn't Gutenberg. Gutenberg's not in that movie. Oh, uh. It was it the was guy Ar- playing the Gutenberg part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy from Batman. Robert Wall. There you go. But uh, Hal David wrote lyrics for uh, Burt Bacharach. He wrote the lyrics to The Look of Love, the Oscar-nominated song from Casino Royale, the terrible Casino Royale. Mm. Uh he also wrote Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, which won an Oscar for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and What the World Needs Now. Basically, every Burt Bacharach song that's in an Austin Powers movie. Um, <laughs> and his brother, Mac David, composed the theme for Cinderella, all the music for the Cinderella Disney movie. Elliot Gould was our lead character here. Noah Dugan covered him in MASH. He was in Oceans 11 through 13. And I would say best known for Mr. Stoppable on Kim Possible. Uh, Genevieve Bujold was Bernadette Lafleur. She played Anne Cruck in Murder by Decree and Claire in Dead Ringers. Ricky Schroeder played Bobby. This was his second film after The Champ, and he'll be back later this year for The Earthling. I'm trying to remember who is in The Earthling with him. I want to say it's the guy from The Changeling, uh, George C. Scott, maybe. I can't remember now. Or William Holden. Who knows? Anyway. We'll find out. We'll find out in The Earthling. Uh, that's like less than a month away too i think and he also played uh detective on nypd blue ricky schroeder did as rick schroeder <laughs> in in adulthood or we're not gonna talk about silver spoons sure we could talk about silver spoons. <laughs> he you know, was on silver spoons you know what's surprising is when i looked him up that show wasn't on you know how they have like the first five things that you oh did, yeah like, it's not in his top things why is it not featured as the number one thing that he's known mm-hmm. for there's on at IMDb. least one thing on there that i didn't recognize too right yeah it's a weird, it's weird choice. Uh, Julie was played by our good friend, Tammy Lauren. Yeah. She is the lead in the Wishmaster film, the first Wishmaster film. And she played a character in MacGyver season one, episode 11, Nightmares. And we actually spoke with her for that episode. And she's a wonderful lady. And she told us it was around the same time that uh, Robin Williams had passed. And she talked about her time working with him on Mork and Mindy mm-hmm. and other uh, interactions that they had had and she was a very sweet lady. John Fujioka played Cleveland here. We had him earlier this year in Private Eyes as Mr. Yuatsum. He was the chef. He was the chef in uh, Private Eyes. At least this movie, he was a little bit less of a stereotype. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. significantly less offensive character. And we covered a lot of his credits in that episode. Yuki Shimoda was Hero, And he'll be back as Katsumo in the Octagon later this year. And of course we had Dana Elkar. Or Dana Elkar, sorry said that wrong for an entire podcast dana elkar was benchley he played pete in macgyver and we had him earlier this year in the nude bomb as the chief mm-hmm. uh, I he think put, and, he, and he put his characters from macgyver in this one he hit pete benchley yeah and i think he'll also be in condor man i'm pretty sure 
from the same director. And is Condor Man also a Disney movie? It is. Yeah. All right. Jess, up or down? You know, I think I'm actually going to give this one an up. Okay. I, interesting. Um, I wasn't bored. Sure. At, at all. I enjoyed the film the whole way through. I thought the acting was good. I thought the story was decent. There's actually nothing that I would consider like bad. Like there's nothing I would have taken out. It, it had a little bit of a weird editing problem with the awkward non-ending thing, but overall I think it was uh, it was a decent film. I gave it an up. Okay. Richard? Uh I think I'm going to give it a down. I did not dislike it. I I was pretty engaged in it, but you mentioned TV movie earlier and this yeah. felt like a very wonderful World of Disney yes. kind of kind of film. And it's from the writers and director of a lot of wonderful World of Disney stuff. So. Yeah. I couldn't imagine have gone to the theater to see it. But yeah, I didn't didn't like it, but didn't hate it. That's it. That's all I got to say. I am also giving it a down. I agree that there's nothing like that stands out as being a problem with it. And I obviously really like Elliot Gould in almost anything. I just feel like there probably wasn't enough for me personally to, right. to recommend this film. A shark almost eats a kid. That is cool. Seeing Ricky Schroeder almost eaten by a shark is decent. Letterboxed, Jess. Uh, so I probably, I guess, put this higher than you guys. I have it above Najinsky and below When Time Ran Out. It's probably a third of the way down my list. Okay. Richard? Mm, uh, boy, how did Night of the Juggler get up so high on my list? Because it's uh, a great movie. <laughs> that's why. Um, I think I'm going to put this between Bronco Billy and the Gong Show movie. Okay. Um, for me, it's also going it's going above Bronco Billy and underneath Hero at Large. So right on the other side of Bronco Billy from our last film, Herbie Goes Bananas. I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Stuntman, which IMDb describes like so. A fugitive stumbles on a movie set just when they need a new stuntman, takes the job as a way to hide out, and falls for the leading lady. We leave you now with a trailer for Stuntman. Step right up, folks. Ride the ride of the century on Eli's killer crane. Stuntman, a man on the run. The woman who had to know why. Who the hell are you? And the director who offered him a hiding place. You shall be a stuntman who is an actor, who is a character in a movie, who is an enemy soldier, who will look for you amongst all those. The Stuntman. In a world where nothing is what it seems, the hardest stunt is to hold on to reality. It doesn't change the fact that the man is crazy. It's the insanity of violence and the madness of make-believe. You're cheating me. You look at me like I'm some kind of damn movie. Well, I'm not. I'm real. I want this shot. Hang on, baby. We're all free. Trapped in a nightmare. Wrapped up in a movie. The Stuntman. An outrageous leap into the unexpected.